This is the wrap-up session of the three of the tandem series of the three artistic research labs that happened in the last two days. Um, we have in the space a sort of open space format. There's three installations, mini sort of miniature installations by Paula, uh, by Katja Münker and uh, Ralf Fischer, here by Paula Kramer and Wallace Heim, and here by Joa Huck and Monica Alacon. The format for, for this sort of installation or presentation is that now we would give an open space for 20 minutes where you can look around, talk, ask, have a taste of the materials. Then Robin Nelson would sort of share some reflections that reconnect uh, to the lecture he gave on Friday morning about practice as research. Robin Nelson has been following closely all the three tandems and he will share his observations, uh, um, the observations he made around 1.30 and that will take about 10 to 15 minutes yeah. approximately and then we have uh, time for questions, comments, um, remarks, observations for the whole group all together. So welcome again all to all of you and, and please enjoy the space. Beispiel Samuel Beckett's Figurenkosmos ist auch eher ein hinkender oder stolpern der Figurenkosmos. Also man liest sehr oft, der hinkt nach rechts. Ich glaube, es ist im Endspiel so, aber auch äh, Vladimir und Estragon hinken. Oder in seinem Roman Watt äh, gibt es eine Figur, die sehr stark eine verfremdete Gangart hat. Also der wird so beschrieben, also Watts Angewohnheit zum Beispiel geradewegs nach Osten zu gehen, war der, dass er seinen Oberkörper so weit wie möglich nach Süden drehte und dann sein rechtes Bein so weit wie möglich nach Norden schleudert. Und er beschreibt dann so in so einer zyklischen Struktur diese Gehtechnik, also dass er dann wieder seinen Oberkörper so weit wie möglich nach Norden dreht und sein linkes Bein so weit wie möglich nach Süden schleudert und so eine Art rasender Stillstand entsteht aufgrund so einer artifiziellen Hinkbewegung. Und Hinken hatte für mich auch so eine Art, nicht nur jetzt eine retardierte Bewegung in Folge von Verletzungen, sondern auch so eine artifizielle Veränderung des alltäglichen, der alltäglichen Gehtechnik. Sort of a score sheet for today's presentation. Okay, okay. Yes. We had third, a third tandem. Okay. We started yes. with a prologue, with a little yes. experiment, then a welcome introduction. Then Monica introduced her research, yes. which is you know, she's a philosopher and she was introducing to her approach to um, do um, phenomenology in dance. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then Thank I you. presented my yeah. research based on body weather, okay. which is yeah. training and performance practice. Yeah, uh, you did in the, the, the uh, in yeah, Amsterdam, I know, I know. But, which yeah. comes yeah. from yeah. Japan. Yeah. And then I explained it, how I approach the research in, in and through body weather okay. and what the point is of, you know, the motivation and the point. I really scanned through it quickly and then we did collectively an experiment um, working with touch, touch okay. and how it relates to language. To also thinking. like the, the, the words you're using, but also like exactly. after, the, after the experience what kind of language is coming up? Both. Both. Exactly. Okay. So yeah. how, okay. how language sort of informs how you yeah. sense and perceive, yeah. Yeah. but then how what you sense and yeah. perceive translates yeah. into language. Then I'm very curious. Did, was it in English or in German? There was a funny thing is my because part was in English. Yeah. 
And then Monica, we did it twice. Okay. And Monica, I did it once. I sort of in, um, yeah. guided it once, yeah. practiced. And Monica did it a second time. And she did it in, in German. German. Because, and she, yeah, yes. because you get totally different um, um, experience yes. if, if it's in your own language or in another language because it has a, a bodily imprint when you yes. hear a word. Yes. So that's always so interesting. Yeah, that does it does it make sense and like and, and literally also makes sense by getting the sensing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think there is probably no authentic. No, but that uh, result. No, and for the, sure. The interesting yeah. thing is that also we got the, then the feedback from one person in the audience that simply yeah. the, the presence of our voice also and exactly. our bodies and yeah. how we were yeah. present was com creating a completely different yeah. experience. The, pres the presenting. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Because we did it both sort of. We both alternated yeah. in the in the guiding through yeah. the work. Very and interesting. It was um, it was a very different experience yeah. when I would uh, guide or when that's uh, like when a theme for a next research. Isn't that it? is in itself a yeah. <laughs> in itself a big thing. Das ist die Struktur des Workshops. Wenn Sie irgendwelche Fragen haben, dann werden wir gebeten. Und dann habe ich doch keine Fragen. Dann müssen wir auch nicht. Oder was Sie schreiben, dann dürfen Sie dann dürfen Sie auch schreiben. Danke. Technik, das heißt Bodywurde. Okay. Und er promoviert gerade über künstlerische Forschung und sein Ausgangspunkt ist gerade diese Bodywurde. Okay. Seine Manipulation. Ähm, man müsste ganz genau mit ihm darüber sprechen, wie er dann das verbindet. Aber es ist wie aus seiner Erfahrung des Körpers dann in eine Reflexion. Wie kann man drüber kommen? Wie kann man das forschen? Und im akademischen äh, Bereich. Ne? Ja, ein total spannendes Thema. Ich bin Fernkreislehrer und ah, beschäftige ja. mich genau mit diesem Thema. Ja, Fernkreis ist natürlich sehr wichtig. Und er hat auch diese Bewusstsein in der Bewegung selbst ja. oder in den ja. Ja, 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 ja. Ja. Also mein Thema ist es äh, jetzt speziell äh, ältere Menschen dazu befähigen, äh, ihren Bewegungsapparat so zu gebrauchen, wie es ursprünglich angedacht war. Ja, und dass die länger, längere Zeit fit bleiben. Ne? Und mehr Lebensfreude haben. It's not one thing, it's not one phenomenon. So maybe what was being experienced yesterday by either Crosby or yourself had something to do with the material. Mm -hmm. And I would be interested in exploring that. You know, because it, it, you mean what does it say about what the material? What does it say about the, the human relation with the material? Mm -hmm. To, to, to actually look at it and mm -hmm. it's, you know, for instance, touch it and stay with it for a while mm -hmm. is a, a different way of maybe experiencing both the matter and the mm -hmm. But it was interesting that so many people did feel something about it. <laughs> Ich habe ein bisschen mich im Studium mit beschäftigt. Also ich hatte so eine Möglichkeit, so neben dem Studium noch so ein paar Philosophiekurse zu machen. Okay. Okay. Und ähm, deshalb war ich für diese spannende Verbindung. Ja, ja, ja. Und wenn du eine Hausarbeit schreiben musst oder irgendwas, dann kannst du so ein Thema aussuchen. Es gibt genug äh, Bibliografie. Mhm. Schön. Ich finde wichtig, dass das weiter, ja. weitergeht ja. und mehr Leute damit involviert werden. Genau. In welchem Rahmen machst du diese Arbeit? 
Also ist das sowas, bist du in einer Forschungsgruppe oder wie muss Ich bin in einer, doch, ich bin in einer zwei Forschungsgruppe, ja. ja. Ähm, aber ich habe verschiedene Baustellen. Ich mache nur Theorie, ganz akademisch. Mhm. Unterrichten an der Uni, bla bla. Ja. In Tanzwissenschaften oder was? Nein, Philosophie. Ja. Thanks very much. Um, and first of all, I would like to say thank you to Joa and all the ten colleagues for bringing uh, practice into the conference, because in my view that's been key to mobilizing a dialogic engagement between words and action. And I want to suggest they've done it through what I want to call serious play. I mean, it's, it's one of the issues that we're dealing with in practices research is finding the right words for talking about what's going on here. And artists often say they don't have a methodology, they just play. And I understand that, but it doesn't go down too well with engineers, you know. What do you mean just play? But serious play maybe captures what I have in mind. I mean, there, there's a playful liberation in all the processes I've experienced in these three tandems, but there's also a kind of seriousness of purpose about the inquiry. So for the moment, serious play is a, a marker that I want to leave with you. So thank you, Gio, it's been, and everybody, it's, it's been great. And I mean, normally there's so many words in a conference, it's wonderful to have a doing, uh, a doing thinking in the conference. I hadn't met any of these people before Thursday night. I shared a couple of emails with you. I feel I know them very well now, which is great. It's been lovely to uh, be with you. Um, but what's been fantastic for me is that there really couldn't be a more insightful enactment of what I was talking about in my lecture yesterday. It really is remarkable how closely what you're doing uh, enacts, embodies what I'm talking about in words. Now, I'm aware that a number of people here weren't in my lecture yesterday, so that's one problem. And I'm also aware that not everybody was in all the three tandems. So I'm going to have to do a little bit of quick summing up, but I'm not going to repeat my lecture of yesterday. And um, for those of you who weren't there, I'm going to pass this round in a moment. It's my last copy, so I need it back at the end. Um, but it's, it's, a, my, it's my model for practice of research. And the key things that um, I need to say about it is it mobilizes different modes of knowing. It deals with what I call know that, which is recognizable academic knowledge, the kind of thing one reads and gets from books and articles. And um, at the top is a mode which is excluded largely from the, the academy, which is know-how, the doing of things, is largely excluded from academic research, not so much in the UK now as I explained, but you know, it's still a new initiative. And the third uh, bit here is know um, what, so a kind of term to kind of describe what I think we've been doing over the last couple of days. We've been exploring know what. The thing about embodied practices is that they are in the body. And I'll say a bit about documentation at the end, but what we've experienced in the body and between bodies in uh, the in your and Monica's workshop today, you can't see on the video. You can see people touching, but you can't feel it. So how do we convey that? And if that's where the knowledge is produced, which is partly what I believe, then what, how do we deal with that in a, an academic research environment where one of the key things about research is it needs to be effectively shared. So if you write a book and an article, that can be moved around the world fairly easily, but you can't move this touching process. Um, and in the middle of it, I should have said at the top, is what I call art practice. I mean, the, the doing of the thing itself is central to the diagram, and the other modes of knowing feed in and out of each other around the diagram. So I'm not going to say anything more about that. I'll just pass it around for those of you if you'd like to have a look and pass it on. Um, that's um, the nub of my diagram. So in the relationship between what I call sometimes insider knowledge, the knowledge in the body, and outsider knowledge, the knowledge that you can have in books and articles, how do they play in and out of each other? As I understand it, all the tandem pairings were also new to each other. They've just met for the first time. But the choice was based on the principle of an insider-outsider engagement. I think that's right, Yo. I don't know if you'd use those words. But an insider-outsider engagement. 
And each of the workshops fostered, and again I'm searching for words here, fostered, I'm going to call it synaptic interconnectedness across the body-mind. Synaptic interconnectedness across the body-mind. There was a real sense in each of the workshops of ideas being fed into a, a doing process and working through that process. Now, that may sound mysterious, but that's what we experienced. And the, the, the doings were quite simple. So again, if I just, I hope not too tritely sum up what we actually did in each of the workshops, this might explain it. So in, in the walking um, tandem, the first one um, yesterday, we went for a walk, quite simply. We did a few exercises in the space to feel the space, to sense ourselves feeling the space and those kinds of things. So there's a self-reflection already going on there. And then we went for a walk. And time, from time to time, we would pause, and um, Ralph or Katia would say a few things. They would mobilize some abstract concepts. Ralph uh, talked about Virilio uh, and Bachelard, and you know, one or two what you'd call theorists, I, don't, I try and avoid that word, were fed in. And um, Katia gave us some instructions to close one ear and hear with one ear, or maybe close one eye. So we did things, and th there was a feeding in and out of doing and thinking, in what I call doing thinking. And that was part of the experience of all these exercises. In uh, Paolo and Wallace's piece, we again explored feeling ourselves in the space, but we uh, attended more to the, the physical environment. We felt the space. And we worked in pairs, but one of the pair initially um, f chose a part of the space, and it was a space much like this, a studio space, to explore with their body, to feel with their body, and they were observed by their partners. And then we went outside, and the process was reversed. The other partner explored the space with their bodies and was observed by the other, and then we came back and pulled it together. And there was a, a setup of some ethical, ecological ideas to feed in, into that. And then in this morning, it's a very delicate process of uh, working with a partner and touching and being touched and sensing that touching. Um, I'm not doing this justice, but that's kind of what we did. And then um, Monica was feeding in some ideas again, ideas from phenomenology. You see on the wall there, zu den Sachen selbst. Um, ideas from Heidegger. Well, yeah. And what I felt was happening was we were working those ideas through our bodies in all the workshops. And a keynote word that came up, and I think everybody used it, was attend. We're going to attend to this. And that's a very interesting word in English. I'm not sure how often it's used. Other English speakers might help me here. Um, we say in school, pay attention, you know, when children are, are distracted. But you mean it in a much more fully sensitive sense. We're attending to our being in the world through the, using the full sensorium to attend to our being in the world. So it's a, 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 a particular accent, I think, but it came up in all, um, in all I think, of the workshops. Um, so the workshop that allows us to experience action in perception, in the title of Alva Noe's book, um, and attend, for me, was the common keyword. We attended to our bodies, our bodies in relation to the ground, in spaces, in relation to the built environment, environment, in relation to material culture. So it was an exploration through experiencing the world, fed in and out with more abstract ideas, in a very kind of organic process, it seemed to me. So each tandem brought some know that on the diagram, philosophy, sociology, cultural theory, ethics, ecology, into the space to engage with a know-how of the things we were doing. And the process experienced by the participants was an inactive exploration and development of know what. Concepts were, and again I want to use the word floated, they were <laughs> let go in the space and worked through in the body-mind as what I call doing knowing. Okay, so moving on from there to the idea of distinguishing academic research projects, one from another. On the face of it, I want to say, all these 
uh, all the tandems were doing the same thing. They were all mobilising a process rather than a product, because yesterday I talked about the practice might be a dance practice or a theatre practice, there might be a product, but these were very much processual, and I actually think the insights in research come out more in the process than the product. But, so these were very much processual, and um, they were all attending to a haptic, proprioceptive, somatic experience of the environment. That would sum them all up, I think. I hope, again, I'm not you know, distorting what you're doing. But on the other hand, they were each different. And one of the things you have to do in practice of research in an academic context is say how you're, what you're doing is slightly different from what they're doing there and they're doing there, <coughs> because you have to bring out your, your own substantial new insights. So I'm going to suggest how I think they were different. And again, I hope I'm not mis it reading, or I'm, I'm making a reading of, I hope it's an acceptable reading of what happened. So Paula and Wallace uh, were concerned with the body in eco space. They were seeking to draw attention to and shift our relations, not just with an other, but with a multiplicity of also others. So there was an ethical dimension to the work, and it was not just other people, it was to other materials, to the material environment, the play between humans and the material world, if you like. So that was one kind of exploration. Kasia and Ralph's walking project was more concerned with resensing the everyday environment and making a challenge to supermodernity and its instrumentalist performance imperatives. So there was, I don't think you actually mentioned the futurists, but your critique of the speed of the modern world had a very futurist ring about it to me. As a the, the futurists thought change would be brought about by speed and dynamics. Ralph's resisting that, I think, in his thinking and walking. Um, and um, the idea of walking as protest came into play in the debate um, with ideas from Virilio and Bachelard. In contrast, Joa and Monica's is a manipulation score, I like that phrase, you are, a manipulation score, and its interaction was, was with phenomenology, with Heidegger, um, and it framed an on and in the body ex exploration, and it's moving in and out of mind body. So it was a much more philosophically, phenomenologically um, based approach through, through the body again. So it, and its approach to change involves a search for agency in an always already changing world by attending to unlocking, shifting, sedimented body-mind habits. So at a surface level they're all the same, but when you start to begin to think about them, they all have a different inflection and a maybe different intention, a different way of focusing. And in research terms, that's what I mean by location in a lineage. You look at your practice, you look at what pe other people working in a similar territory are doing, and you begin to say, ah, oh, that's interesting. Paul is doing that. It's like what I'm doing, but I'm doing this. And you begin to get to understand what is the specificity of your research inquiry and your outcomes in that process. And similarly, um, we've talked about rights and sites and lone twin and the other, you know, walking. You could, could look at those and you do look at those and say well I'm, I'm my practice is a walking practice but it's different from theirs in this way and from those in that way you come to identify what you're doing okay um yeah final sort of comment on documentation which you've experienced around you today um documentation is really important in this effective sharing you know i, th I think i said in the lecture yesterday if you 20 of us or so has experienced it here this morning, and that's the best way to do it. But how then do we get it out there to the world? Now, you can, there's all kinds of means of documentation, video, audio, posters, feedback. You need to consider what suits your, your process best. We all understand, I think, it's not the experience itself. You, you can only get that through doing it. And that's the primary way. In the UK, for a practice of research PhD, um, there's a protocol, it's not a regulation, that the examiners experience the work live. So they would come and do your workshops. 
And that's really important, I think, in that process. But in the research audit that I'm involved in, that's just impossible to do. So we have it on video. But we all know that's not what we're seeing. So it's the convergence of the bits of evidence that help give us the insight and persuade us how it's, how it's working. So, um, Joa said this morning in the introduction, um, you've already got lots of information in your bodies. I thought that was a really interesting phrase because people would normally say in your minds. And that kind of summed up the difference of what we've been doing here in a kind of body mind exploration rather than hearing papers in a verbal frame. So I'm going to stop there and we can open the discussion. Thank you. to that. I mean, the first is that not all artists need to come into the academy, and if they don't want to, don't come, as it were. Now, having said that, um, I recognise that artists are drawn into the academy for all kinds of reasons, sometimes to earn money, because they get part-time jobs teaching their processes, or full-time jobs teaching their processes. So it's not simply a, 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 an open choice. But it's not for everybody. And if you really feel it inhibits your process and your practice, maybe that's not the, not the way to go. But there's all kinds of reasons why people these days might want to get a PhD or whatever, and reasons why people who are you know, working in the academy need to submit research and research audits that I talked about yesterday. This is part of the instrumental culture which R Ralph quite probably is militating against. So I quite openly say that what I'm doing is a pragmatic thing. It's trying to build that bridge to allow people who want to be in the academy or, or find themselves in there and find they have to do research, how to do it with the minimal disruption of their practice. So in, in my chapter two, the how to do it of, uh, chapter of the book, it's kind of saying that professional practices do most of the things we're talking about already. They do document, they do reflect on, they do all these things. It, it's not a big step, it's not a whole lot more to meet that institutional role. That's, that's a kind of my persuasive argument, as it were. But it's not for everybody, and if people don't want to do it, that's fine. But a, a different, sort of better thing, one of the reasons why I started with um, Bonnie Beveridge Cohen yesterday was when she started out as a practitioner, uh, first of all, she met all kinds of resistance, as you, you probably all know, because you know more about it than I do, to her practice as a, a therapeutic practice. And then she, when it was working, other people wanted to know how she got it to work, so she set up a school to train people to do it, so they could then train other people. But that process of body to body to body is a very slow process. And one of the reasons, you know, I think she wrote the book um, was to get it out there a bit, a bit more. And she finds interview strategies and photographs and all kinds of ways of documentation 
of doing that. So the, the, the need might come from not just from the instrumental rationale of the academy, it can come from just the wish to get your, get your process out there, to get it known a bit better, because you believe it's a good thing. You know. Except you can't become a BNC practitioner by reading Bonnie's book. No. You know, it, that's not no, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But you can move some way to understanding it. Yeah. You, know, that's, you go towards it. And then if you really think, yeah, this is really good stuff, then you go and do one of the summer schools or, or whatever. Which again, you might say is not enough, you know. How long do you have to train in these kinds of practice, you know. So, yeah. Maybe I uh, think it's kind of a comment or something which is uh, struggling or troubling me. I think what we're doing or what uh, practice as research can do is, um, is also that working at the shift of the concept of body or the, co the relation between the body and the world. Mm -hmm. So I think we have a very strong tradition uh, focusing on the body as something like a machine or the body as a, or the human subject as a cogito ergo sum, something which is thinking and which is justified by thinking and um, what uh, Joa and other uh, protagon protagonists do in that concept as research is in my perception also that work in defining something new, uh, giving focus on a new concept of the body and its relation to the world. Maybe a more energetic, a more tactile body, a sensing body. Yeah. And that's the kind of knowing that's hard to sh share except through doing it. And that's absolutely right. But the, the limitation then is that you do it with a relative, you know, all the people who are in the workshop this morning will know how it feels, you know. It's, it's a feeling knowing. But those who weren't in the workshop won't know that. So what do we do? So we say, well, okay, we, that's, we have to limit it to that. But you see, if you start reading the, the, the feedback on the poster here, you get a sense of how people responded to it, and you can get a sense of how it felt for them, which is not the same as doing it, but you can begin to get into it that way. And convergence of different modes of evidence, you see the video, you see what was happening, you see the touching, you see, you can get a sense of the sensitivity, I think, in the space, although you can't actually feel it, you can see what was happening. And then you read the responses, you begin in this convergence of evidence. That's, you know. <laughs> I just finished my practice-led PhD in the UK, and it was a wonderful experience. I mean, utterly wonderful experience, and, and it was very scary and, and, and difficult, and getting completely lost in it. Um, but what I felt was, uh, it's very much, first of all, a learning experience. It is, it is not not different from any other learning. It's just in a PhD framework. So getting, and, and it's very, very practical. It's, it's like you learn to go shopping, or it's like you learn to, you need to know what you want. Yes. You need to know where the shop is. You need to know how much money you need for this. You need to know the context. You need to know what you then want, perhaps what you want to do with it. And, and one of the things that the, this morning was very exciting going into um, City Labi's talk, where he talked about dramaturgy, and he talked with his dramaturgy, and he said, what was just so exciting in the process of dramaturgy was the feedback loop, mm -hmm. the feedback mm -hmm. dynamic with you. And, and so, so beyond the learning that I felt that happened through the PhD and is, a, is an opportunity in the research, it's that the more you make yourself part of feedback loops with your supervisors, with your peers, with your research companions, and also with the examiners, that it, it becomes a, a meaningful mode of knowledge production, of shared knowledge production. And, and one of the things is the examiners in my Viva, where I had to defend my research, which was quite painful, where they said, you know, it's about becoming articulate. It's about not them, it's about me. It's about me becoming more empowered to say what I want to say, to become better at my practice, to share that more with others, to, to, to share the, the, the treasure of this embodied practice, as you talked about, that is intangible cultural heritage. You know, we are all engaged with something that's intangible cultural heritage, and we need to 
and we want to and we wish to open it out to the world and this is our gift that we have when we do this research that we are learning how to do it you know and so i've compared to some of my other colleagues who felt oh i'm jumping hoops all the time this the institution is squashing me the structure says why should i justify my work i never saw it like this i always thought oh god isn't this interesting you know, wow, I hadn't even thought of this. Oh, God, isn't this difficult or something like that. But never did I feel I have to jump or something. Mm -hmm. And the more you get rid of that mindset, it's, it can be a very exciting journey. Mm -hmm. Wallace? Yeah. yeah. No, I, I'm just from a point of view of someone teaching, and it's, it's really interesting to, uh, to ask you, Robin, there is such a responsibility for a critique that matches what you're seeing. It's, it's not just sort of the structure of what one's doing or whether it's new or something. It's actually getting into what you're watching. And then, as a teacher, being able to offer the critique that will not close it down, but move it forward. Mm -hmm. And also that, you know, how you develop a critiques, or how you develop critiques that are as new as what you're seeing. Because it's, it's quite easy to critique it according to some sort of other view, but to, to try to match it and really just to get your thoughts on that. Mm. Um, I still I think more, um, I don't know if you were at the Bill for Scythe conversation with the dramaturg, um, which they were describing a chaotic process which was lots of fun and that they laughed 80% of the time. Um, it seems to me the supervision is much more like that kind of thing. I mean, it's not like, I mean, I try to see and experience, go to the workshops and experience what the work is, and then give some feedback, some ideas, a bit like I'm doing a very shorthand this morning. And I'm not sure in advance what they are, because it, it comes from the work. So it's a bit different, I think, from more traditional models of um, PhDs, where there's a, a, a kind of body of knowledge already established, and you have to know all that knowledge, and then you add your little stone to the pile. That was the model I was given when I started my PhD. It really is a reciprocal engagement. And so it's actually, it's quite exciting to supervise, but it's a bit more scary in a way, um, because you don't quite know where you're going, and because the, the, the reaching out to the ideas could go in lots of different directions. So I find myself suggesting, well, ha have a look at that. Maybe that will be interesting. And then if that doesn't work and it's going somewhere else, have a look at that. And always touch wood. <laughs> Um, it, something has come through that process, but it's the very uh, supervision process is a, a processual thing, which I, I like. But it is quite scary for some people because um, academics like control, and, and you have to go a bit out of control to do to do that. And certainly, some of my early things, were, when I look back on them, are a bit scary. Um, in the book I took about Bob, Bob and Lee, the, the um, PhD that I supervised, this was, with, this was about collaboration, it was a collaborative PhD, but they, this was a married couple who were doing two P, a PhD together and wanted to do it completely collaboratively, and the, the final piece was a recommittal of their wedding vows in the motorway services cafe on the M6 motorway, and they did all kinds of crazy things um, on the, that motorway. Um, and, you know, I'm responsible for research ethics in the institution. You know, <laughs> no, no. So you, you have to, you know, how far could I let them play, so to speak? And, and it's, it's scary, but it is exciting. You know. Fortunately, it came out okay in the end, but it, that was a bumpy ride. floating concepts into space. I really appreciated that. And, and I would like to, to add to the, I'm gonna touch you, to the, the direct exchange um, and the, the verbal exchange, the, this, exactly that, the, the space. And as soon as, as um, the wave, or the, the place maybe from where we speak changes a little bit and gives the chance that concepts are a little bit more soft or open or vulnerable is something very nice also to words. 
So suddenly this experience, the direct body-to-body -body experience, it, it, it can find a connection in, in space with, um, with these vulnerable concepts. So and I'm very sure that in, in those spaces, very fast exchange or very fast learning could also happen. So aha momenta, so like, oh, that's it. It's, yeah. It can be really very quick. That was one thing, and I remember from our um, little group in three preparing kind of these, this tandem, we were very concerned of how do you create a space where talking can still relate oh, to that experience. And I'm really thankful to all you so-called theoreticians that I experienced that you practice that. That's mm. very, it's a big gift. Mm. Well, thank yeah. you for the floating, because that's really what I felt you did. And that was for me a slightly new experience. I mean, I always think ideas and doing you know, interplay, but there really was a sense of a very gentle, but clear, letting these ideas circulate in the space. And that's really key. And I like in your documentation that there are books and articles amongst the videos and so on. It, it seems a very natural way and proper way for you to work. Now, in the early debates uh, in an organ a thing called PARIC, the Praxis Research and Performance Investigation, that some of you will know about, um, a quite well-known choreographer, who I won't name, um, did a talk a bit like this, and she started by saying, when I go into the studio, I leave my theory at the door. And I said, oh. <laughs> This is, is the opposite of what it's about. You know, it's about the imbrication of theory within practice. So that was a very disappointing moment in it. And you don't do that, you know. You don't bring theory in the space and ban it. You float it into the space. And that's very nice. It's very beautiful. Yeah. Oh, one more thing. Yeah. Uh, to give credits to one uh, who isn't here, who can't be here, Andrea Keitz. She's part of ARIA, the Artistic Research Lab. And that connects to the documentation and the sharing in in groups because she she actually is on the congress she's documenting the tans Erbe part of the uh, congress and she did a couple of uh, working exchanges with us on uh, documentation as research and practice um, so that is i guess that came in in with how we how we went with that I think um, I want to finally thank, say again, but one more thank you to the Tanz Congress also. Mm. Because Tanz Congress, uh, we have to say, really made it possible for three tandems, you know, to be devised, designed, mm. you know, to connect with you. Mm. Um, so it was a wonderful opportunity to go into a risky area of not knowing mm. really exactly how and who you're going to meet and how you're going to do that. And uh, it was a re very rewarding experience after a long process uh, that started a long time ago and the negotiations with Tanz Congress they made it possible. So I really have to credit them, thank mm. them a lot as well. Mm. Thank you for a wonderful, intense uh, mm. days mm. and uh, thank you for coming and, and sharing and for bringing you into the space as well. Yeah. Thank you.